But let's go back to his crowning achievement of rage. I had a few coaches that do that, but never with the skill and precision by which that boat shattered into a million pieces. That's unbelievable. <laughs> you, you know how the guys, you know, they stack up the blocks and they hit to do it with their head? Steve Kerr may have a future. There's only one way to figure this out, and that's for me to do it. But before we get to my feet of strength, let's just take a smaller step back. This stunt of his, how much did it do for his rep, his reputation? Maybe not for the players, but for the rest of the league and the fans. I mean, just listen. First of all, it was a much better, cleaner break than the first one I had this year in New York. Was, this was a really, really good clipboard break. It's all they ask him about. They're so curious, and he just plays it perfectly. Like, he didn't even know what was going to happen. I didn't think it was right. Broken three of them. Yeah. So that was my cleanest break. That was a good one. Listen, now that little Kerr is now a hothead tough guy. This clipboard break is a defining moment of his career, and the media's fawning over it gave us the tyrant we have today. See, now I'm using the actual dry erase marker that came with this cheap ass board. I'm guessing Steve had something a little sharper at the edge of his. I thought you would break a smash the paper with with pen. Right, yeah, like yeah, I can, yeah, you can tell that. You, maybe that's what happened. That's why I think this is rehearsed. I assume it's kind of like a backboard, like when Shaq broke those backboards or Daryl Chocolate Thunder Dawkins was breaking backboards. You had to know where to break it. To Daryl Dawkins. Oh, hey! Again. And that's what I assume the key here is. You gotta know where. He actually wrote poetry based on shattering backboards and glass flying, Robinzine crying. By the way, look here. Look at little Steve. Just happens to be in this feature piece about Daryl Chocolate Thunder Dawkins breaking backboards. Hmm. I wonder if it stuck with him. I wonder if this was a spark in his long-term, perfectly executed plan to develop his own reputation as a clipboard-breaking white chocolate thunder coach. That's just interesting. This is something I happened up on and didn't even realize that Steve Kerr would be in this particular clip. Steve seemed to hit it somewhere around here. And I'm sure this isn't quite the same material, but probably is, actually. Here we go. I mean, but let's stop for a second and really drill home this point. How important a moment like this is. Bruce Lee would be proud. Just one. For years, players have had signature moves, iconic looks and ways and hats. And players, good or not, can live off of these little recognizable things and moments. A finger wag can give you a career well beyond your playing days. And I'll drill this home until the day I'm in my own icebox. The Iceman, this nickname, has given him a career far beyond what anybody would have expected. You got this. You cool. In these moments, these nicknames, these images, they become shorthand for an entire reputation. For example, again, Bobby Knight, a hothead, but he's lived off this chair throw. His legend isn't as big without this moment, a perfect representation of what people thought he was. From Dominique in the windmills, to Jordan in the tongue and all the other things. Daryl Dawkins and dunking hard, breaking backboards. It only happened twice in his career, but we all know it. Coaches need this too. Pat Riley had his slick back hair, right? Phil Jackson has his I don't give a shit one way or another demeanor in crunch time. Red, rock and his cigars. If Kerr breaks another clipboard cleanly, slick just like that, he will have his thing. He'll be Steve Clipboard Breaking Kerr, which is much better than the way he's known now for his whack-ass lineups and critical moments. Why the hell was Festus in the game in game seven? Why was he in there guarding LeBron? Why was he in there? Anyway, see, it's clearly a gimmick. It's science, not strength. Kerr knew just where to hit it, because he's got a pile of broken clipboards back at the casa. See, it's like ripping up a phone book. You know what I mean? Yes, I know it's not a phone book, but who the fuck has a phone book? 
I mean, ripping a phone book is like a parlor trick. Like balancing bowling balls. Like juggling. Like shooting free throws with your eyes closed. That tunnel shot Steph Curry does that he got from Monte Ellis before each game. I mean, we can't all take our gimmicks and make them a career doing half times like the great Red Panda. But... I mean, am I that brolic? Yes, maybe. But did I also use a technique? Yeah, you can Google that all you want. But putting gimmicks on the back burner, let's talk about branding, rebranding. Something even stranger happens when what's real and fake start to KG back on itself. All this losing it and playing it up for whatever reason starts to become a trait of its own, the acting or just accentuating a true feeling for an end goal of influencing the refs or sending a message to the league or firing up your team like those paddles from every medical show. A shock may now be administered. Or in some cases, playing it up to communicate to a single person just for a moment in hopes of building a better relationship. And uh, DeMarcus says thank you for getting it instead of me. Whatever it is, if you keep doing it, then maybe it does become part of you. I mean, how many of our habits came built into us right out of the womb? How many are learned? How many of the things we do and say are just sh we saw and liked and took and tweaked? And 15 years later, it's an essential part of who we are. The point is, we are so far down the rabbit hole that this may not be a show. And it may be something Steve has to be cognizant of at all times, when he's at home, when he's mad at his kids or his wife, or the doctors who screwed up his back. Maybe he's always been a little rageaholic. And finally, this stage has given him the outlet, taking his rage a step further. For example, how long does a player need to flop until these types of reactions are simply how they react to the world's interactions? And on flopping, maybe this is just so ingrained into these guys at this point, so deeply rehearsed that it's not even flopping anymore. Meaning it's not fake. And let's say you bump into them in the real world, they may very well display a small version of this behavior. I mean, this all goes to my grand KG theory, Kevin Garnett theory. That he was one of the first players to adopt a character so wholeheartedly to the point where he lost his actual center and sensibility into that character and completely became the character. I mean, just look at this commercial. He is still trying to convince us that he is crazy. I'm not even explaining this. You know, people just call me crazy because I wouldn't get any sleep, but I would sit up and wonder why or what could I have done different. People gonna think you crazy. People ain't gonna understand you weird. What's wrong with you? And he's doing it himself. For real, that's not your job, man. Other people should be spreading your lore. You can't still be out here doing this level one leg work. Oh, look at me. Look how imbalanced I am. Oh, damn, I could do anything. I'm crazy. For example, did Dennis Rodman ever make a commercial saying, Oh, look at me. Look at me. I'm effing nuts. Oh, no, no, no. No. The commercials he made were playing off of that previously understood concept. They were putting a spin on it, using the understood genuine insanity that denotes insanity as a misdirect. Dennis, you're just a little bit too tight, man. You need to loosen up. For me? Be provocative. Don't be so conservative. Shake things up. Be shocking. Let your hair down. Please, lay off the hair, okay? Over the top, man. Be an individual. So what do you want me to do? Well, you can start by eating your pizza the wrong way. See, the joke is that we know Rodman doesn't need to come out of his shell and be more of an individual because we already know he is. That is the default base level information that makes this commercial funny, I guess. Same with David Robinson. It's the juxtaposition. David Robinson, the straight-laced Navy boat captain, admiral, telling Dennis Rodman that he needs to lighten up. That's funny. We're supposed to be funny. We don't have Dennis Rodman here running around trying to prove that he's nuts. That would just be desperate and obvious. See, it's the subverted expectations that make it feel funny. And it's our unspoken, common, basic understanding of who these individuals are to give us all the base knowledge for this commercial to work. Turn it around. Well, Dave, you crazy, man. You crazy. On the other hand, Kevin Garnett is just something way too self-aware with KG to be genuine. It's like this. If you're funny, you don't have to go around saying that you're funny. You're just funny. If you're genuinely smart, you don't have to preclude your smart statements with, and you know I'm smart. You know I have the best brain, the, the best, best words. Word. You don't have to say that. KG 
On the other hand, knew what he wanted to become and what he had to be. Anything's possible. And made himself into that man until folks actually started buying it. Anything's possible! Well, some folks, because there's this strain of people who were more often close to him who don't buy the act. Do you think he's on many people's Christmas no. card list in the NBA? No. What we, happened to him? Yeah, I was going to say, because for so long when he was in Minnesota, he gave everyone this the feeling that he was a nice guy. And he's only mean to the young guys and the Euros for some reason. <laughs> You know, I don't know why, but he's that's who he doesn't like. So. And Charlie Villanueva, too. I mean, what was that all about? Garnett called him a cancer patient during the game. Here are the tweets posted by Villanueva. Quote, KG talks a lot of blank. He's probably never been in a fight. I would love to get in a ring with him. I will expose him. What was he doing with his jersey? Uh, what was it, Friday night? He was, Olymp he was showing his chest because he, he, he was showing that he had a lot of heart. But those few people are not going to be the storytellers who pass on KG to a new generation. Besides, it's already been passed on. See, folks have already taken hold to the image and started to model themselves after a man that never existed. A character inspiring reality. One more thing, KG. Look, for real. I don't think a lot of people know this, though, KG. Like, so, my whole high school career, I wore number 21. Like, everybody called me baby KG. Like, you was the instant. You are one of the only reasons why I'm probably here right now. I don't think I ever told you that. So when it's all done and KG is passed on, what will really be real? Really, if we remember him as he wanted us to, well, guess what? Then he's the winner. And there's nothing anybody can do about it. He just has to stay committed. And you know what? Good for him. Really. Really, good for him. But that aside, there's just so many levels to the show. And that leads me to this little overplay. When coaches and assistants are not working with the same scripts, you end up with one of these unnecessary hold me backs. I know folks talk a lot a ton about how folks don't really want to fight, and they wait for the hold me back to get tough. But what the heck is with these premature holder backers? Folks get so out of hand trying to hold players and coaches back. Listen, you do not need to hold Fred Hoiberg back, my man. What's funny is if you see here, looks like he's trying to hold him back like he didn't make enough of a scene or something like friend of the show randy brown here is used to a second charge out of the tunnel back to the ref and he was cueing his coach here fred to not leave you didn't make a scene i mean shit, we all know the worst thing that will ever happen between a coach and a ref is a little bit of bumping at least that's what we think anyway back to steve there was a point when it looked fruitless downright corny when he would go through his little tantrums. But now I see more heart in action as opposed to thought and reaction. You see what I'm saying? I think even though this bit got tired immediately and the announcers would even walk us through it as the act was happening. The bench with a raise being held back by assistant coach Mike Brown. And I tell you what, you love having your coach fight for you. And then the players caught on, even if they already knew. Leandro Barbosa has to hold them back. It was painfully obvious that we all knew that they knew. But since they knew, they then became complicit. What I'm saying is maybe we all jumped into the looking glass just maybe one pain further, as it was reborn in sincerity. And the act of caring became actual caring. And the little bit of Steve Kerr that looked forward to acting out a scene, charging towards an official, that little part of him grew and grew and festered until he legitimately became the hot head he portrayed on TV. So as we saw through it all at first, Steve fabricated another layer of reality. So through the act of faking it, we grew the reality of being it. Steve Kerr is done for the night. Fireworks here at Golden One Center. And that's how we got to this real moment. And Kerr's got to be restrained. Or maybe not. crazy you thought i couldn't break that come the f on you thought i couldn't break that sh come on get the f up come on man kidding me break that sh the f come on man